Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. <clears throat> and uh, this morning, um, we are we are on the verge. Uh, let, let me uh, let me just let me prepare you first of all. Wait a minute. Let me prepare myself because I have a feeling I'm not going to make you happy today. So I'm going to be talking about a subject that is um, probably voodoo in the church today. I'm going to bring a subject up that I don't think wants to be touched with a 10-foot pole. But I prayed and I asked the Lord that this must be said, and I asked the Lord to help me with the right heart, and I asked the Lord that gives you the right heart to listen. So I don't want nobody getting mad at me. I'm going to talk about politics. And you know the old saying that says you don't talk about religion and politics when you're out there in the world. But you realize that God is all about politics. God is all about government. He really is. As a matter of fact, I didn't plan on doing this because, but it fits, for those of you that have been with us for these last through the month of September, we talked about the blessing and how God wants to bless his people. And then I mentioned to you that at the very end, and we'll come back to it maybe in November, but in the very end, God told Moses to tell his brother Aaron and their son, his sons, to also pray this blessing upon the children of Israel, upon the people of God. Listen very carefully. Don't, I, do not be distracted here this morning. And so when we see the priestly line, it really didn't end. It did end physically to a point because the high priest Jesus came in and just, just totally uh, took ownership and became the high priest. No more priest. We only need one, the high priest Jesus Christ, and he's still alive. Got it? All right, so we don't need, but there's still a priestly line, and guess what? You're it. Now, we'll talk about that in November, but it does go along with what I'm about to say, because what, what we are to represent, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are a chosen people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're going to tie that in this month, starting today. So when we think about the priest, a priest is to represent God. It's like an ambassador. We are to represent God to the people. Not just the people of God, but to people even that are not into God, regardless. So being that that is our mission I think that this song that we just finished singing is so appropriate because when we look at the lyrics, and Kelly, if you can help me, I want to look at the verses one more time, and I want, I want to read those verses one more time, and I want you to follow along with me as we do this. Here's verse 1. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. Yeah. Oh, it's not up there, huh? I see. Come on, guys, lighten up, amen? <laughs> it, it, that's what they sing. It come, Kimmy, how come the words are not there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's supposed to be the whole earth shakes. Right, Alicia? Yeah. Verse 2, listen very carefully. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing, the people sing. These lyrics talk about a people of God that are anticipating the soon return of our king. Coming in the clouds. Amen. But before he comes, the, the lyrics in verse 2 says, And I see his love and mercy. It's washing over our sin. Aren't you glad that you have been washed by the blood of Jesus? Amen. So it gives us a reason to sing. Verse 3 says, I see a generation 
rising up to take their place with selfless faith. You are that generation. Now, if this song was written a thousand years ago, they would have been that generation. So we see that as of the time of Jesus, the generation, no matter what season, what time period, what era in which you now, you and I now live in the 21st century, and in this generation of the 21st century, we are that generation to rise up and take our place. This is not a time for us to sit down. This is not a time to stay in the dugout. This is the time to engage in the game because God is entrusted within us to do his mission, to continue the mission that Jesus started 2,000 years ago. Are you following with me? Verse 4, I see a near revival stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. But then I love the bridge. Now here's the bridge. Heal my heart and make it clean. Let me get the lyrics here. I got them right here in front of me. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. God's doing something, gang. I hope that we are not a people of God who have our heads stuck in the sand and trying to hide of everything that might be going on. It may not look pretty right now, but God is doing something. In the spiritual, God is moving, and God has not ever stopped moving. And we are in a time right now that we need to see what God is doing. I love it. It says, open up my eyes. This is a great prayer. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. There is a kingdom of God that is in operation from the very beginning of time, whether you realize it or not, from the time of even before the foundation of the world. And we know that, and, 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 and I'm going to try to say and speak very slowly, and I hope very clearly, so that you really follow what God wants to say to us this morning. Because... Things are wild right now. Things are really crazy. Somebody say amen. amen. We know that. And there are so many things right now that are taking place. Not that it's new. Because ever since sin came into the world in Genesis chapter 3. Sin, under the control of Satan. And the things that man has done. Has broken the heart of God. It truly has. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And they pierced him and blood and water came from his side. Scientifically, medically, they say that was as of a, from a broken heart. And there are things that have happened from the time sin has entered the world throughout. I mean, it really breaks, it broke the heart of God even within the first thousand years. I preached it all last summer of summer of 19 about Noah and God at, 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 a, at the time of Noah's birth at the time of no, it was about a thousand approximately a thousand years and God finally said we're starting all over again this is this is breaking my heart and he wiped out everything by the flood but that didn't wipe out sin because the sinful nature was still in man and sin began again from the time of Noah to the time of now but God's promise was he'll never destroy the world again or mankind by the flood, there's another destruction coming. Read your Bible. But there's things that have always broken the heart of God, but things that are still relevant or still have increased even till this day. Pornography is on the rise. It's out of control. Drug addiction, it's out of control. Alcoholism, out of control. Increase of domestic violence. And we see that. We're hearing about it in the news. It's, 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 it's rising. Child abuse is on the rise. Spousal abuse is on the rise. Suicide is on the rise. Violence is on the rise. 
Murder is on the rise. Criminal activity is on the rise. Before, here in our own community, it used to be that the only vehicles that you would see in the crime beat that were stolen was Hondas or Toyotas. It seemed like Hondas and Toyotas, that was the target. But to tell you how the criminal activity and auto theft is on the right, they're still in everything and anything. doesn't matter. You can still be driving that 69 Ford. They want it. If you're driving a Gremlin, they want it. If you're driving... You guys even know what the Gremlin was? You have to be, you have to be over 40 to know that one. Amen. It doesn't matter. They're stealing everything and anything, and they're breaking into cars. Uh, criminal activity is on the rise. Human trafficking is on the rise. Attack on law enforcement is on the rise. Division within our own country. We've never seen it like it is today. Division within the family. Relatives fighting on Facebook with each other. Friends, it's just out of control. Division within the church. Not this church, but division within... <laughs> but division within churches. Everybody's angry. And here we are on the verge of the most important elections of our history of America. And nobody, does the church even want to talk about it? I'm going to talk about it today. Because people are, people are out of their minds. People are out of their minds. Because of social media, because of newspapers that are very liberal, news stations that are biased. It doesn't matter what news station you watch, CN, uh, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, it doesn't matter. They have their biases. They're going to tell you what they want you to hear. They're going to have their opinions, and instead of facts, they're going to give you their comments, their opinions, and you don't know who to believe. I can tell you right now, the one you can believe is God. God's word is true, and that's the way I'm going to present this this morning. So I'm not taking a side to the left or side to the right, even though the sheep are going to the right. <laughs> That's God's word. Don't get mad at me. God's word. Come on, don't get mad at me. The goats are to the left, the sheep are to the right. That's Jesus said. But listen, don't get mad at me. That's about people, not agendas. Keep following me. Did I, I hope I didn't lose you. You still with me? But you don't know who's telling the truth. Here, here's, my, here's my scripture that I want to share. And then we're going to take off from here. So I'm going to take you on a journey. Don't lose track. I'll know by the look on your eyes. So I want to make sure you stay with me. And listen very carefully. Take notes. If you don't have something to write down with, you can go back to the, our website. These are archived, these messages. You can go back, listen to it, check it out. Don't take my word for it. But what I'm about to present to you is strictly God's word. So listen very carefully. So in Romans chapter 12, here is what it says, verse 2. The men use this every Wednesday morning in their Bible study. This is the foundation of, of the men's Bible study. But here's what verse 2 says. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, you can argue with that. We all want to know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, in order to know what that good and perfect and acceptable will of God is, you have to go to God's word. You, your opinion and my opinion doesn't matter. Your agenda, my agenda doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the news says to us, whatever news media you get it from, it doesn't matter. What matters is that it is, there is a perfect will of God. And that's what the Bible says. And in order for you to know what that perfect will of God is, that acceptable and perfect will, 
you have to have your mind transformed. You and I have to have our minds renewed. You follow me with me? Now, here's what the word conform means. Here it says, and do not be conformed. You know what the word conformed in the Greek means? The word conformed is from the Greek word skeskematso, which simply is where we get the English word schematic or scheme. And a schematic or a scheme is a diagram, a plan, an agenda. So when it says, do not be conformed, there is an agenda, there is a plan that is in place. You follow me? And God says, don't follow that plan. Don't follow that diagram. Don't follow that scheme. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't follow that. That's what this verse is telling us. Because the scheme of the world is anti-God. The scheme and the plan of the world is anti-Christ. Anti-God in the Old Testament, Christ, though he was there, they didn't know, it, Christ hadn't, the incarnate Son of God hadn't come, or the carnate Son of God had not come, but the incarnate Son of God was there, they just didn't see it. We see it because we have scripture to show us. But the carnate Christ didn't come into the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, all that man had was God. And the agenda of the world from the fall of man was anti-God. Why was it anti-God? Because Satan had complete control. Man forfeited that control in Genesis chapter 3. Adam forfeited that, gave dominion back over to Satan. And Satan, since Genesis chapter 3, has had dominion over this world and still does. So there's an anti-God in Old Testament and an anti-Christ in the New Testament. Are you following with me? So there's this plan that has been put in place, this scheme that Satan has. And the reason why I say that, some may say, well, the Antichrist hasn't come yet. No, 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 no. The, the spirit of Antichrist is already in place. Jesus himself said, no, not Jesus. John said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, the spirit, I'm, let me just modify it. The spirit, I don't know if I gave you that. Maybe I did. Let me just read it. The spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard, was coming and is now already in the world. Those are the words of John in 1 John 4, 3. So let's go back. Romans 12, 2. I want to read it in the NIV this time. It, it pretty much says the same thing. Don't be conformed to this world, or as NIV says, to the pattern of this world, it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You will be able to test and approve what God's will and God's per pleasing and perfect will. The New Living Translation, read, I like the way the New Living also says it. Here's that same verse, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. God wants to change the way we think, and he wants to change the way we think by his spirit and by his word. Don't conform to the behavior, the pattern, the customs of this world. Don't, don't conform to the anti-God, anti-Christ agenda. And as followers of Christ, there is a different agenda. There is a different rule that you and I are to follow. And that rule is the rule of the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there is a king, and his name is King Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So, let me continue. Do I have you still? Jesus made it clear. You remember when Jesus was before Pilate? Here's what he told Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you king? And then Jesus says this. He says, Jesus, in John 18, 36, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. This is what Jesus taught his disciples. This is what Jesus still wants us to understand is that though we may live in this world, we are not of this world. If you have been born again, your citizenship now is in heaven. Though we may in a way be a citizen of the United States, this is where physically we may be, but spiritually God has already assigned us to be a citizen in heaven. And there is a, there is a spiritual kingdom that we are to abide by. 
Now, next week, you know, I'm not going to cover it this morning, but next week we're going to find out, okay, if, gov if God has already established governments, then where is it that I don't have to obey the government? I'll talk about that next week. You, you ought to come back. So here we have these first century believers. First century believers that Jesus taught them and they passed it on to say this world is not our home. And we are of a different kingdom. Jesus made it clear. And the first century believers, the followers of Christ, they understood this. And they lived it out by faith expecting Jesus to come back at any moment just like we are waiting right now. And those early believers, they were expecting Jesus to come back perhaps the next day, perhaps next week, maybe in a few weeks. They lived by faith knowing that it was imminent that Jesus was coming back for them. And then they, of course, didn't see that come to flourishing. I've been living or I've been walking with Jesus for 46 years myself, coming to the Lord at the age of 14. And Jesus has still not come back. Will he come back? I don't know when he'll come back. I know it's soon. I may pass before he comes back, and then I'll be like those first century believers, living out my life by faith, waiting for the promise of his return, but yet it didn't come. This is what they, they, they did not give up. Let me quote, let me read it out of the NIV in Hebrews. Let me, uh, let me find it here for a minute. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13 through 16, here's what it says in the NIV. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead... They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Somebody say amen. amen. So when we see this, these people knew that this world was not a permanent home. They were looking forward to the heavenly home, and that's the home that we should be looking forward to. Amen. Amen. We have to understand that as the pilgrims, or as they refer to them as pilgrims or sojourners, depending on how, what translation you're reading, strangers, we're just passing through, gang. We're passing through. And we know that even as we're passing through and even as we have this world that we're living in and we trust in God and God is in control, somebody say amen, God never has gotten out of control, does that mean that we should really not care for who wins the election or what issues are voted upon. Should we not even care because, after all, this world's not my home. I'm leaving. I don't care what happens to people around here. That is not the heart of God, and I'll prove it to you why. God's heart is that we make a difference. God's heart is that on November 3rd, you do vote. And I wish I would have told you this sooner, but today is November the 11th, and according to what I understand was October the 5th was the deadline to register. I hope you're registered. I hope you are one that, re that had registered or that has voted. I hope you haven't sent in your vote yet until you had heard this message. Because this is very crucial on November 3rd of what takes place. We absolutely must vote. And I'm going to tell you who to vote, how to vote, without being biased. You have heard me say time and time again, it, it, it like comes up a lot, even when I'm talking to people, I always say you've got to go back. No matter what the question is, no matter what the issue is, you always got to go back to Genesis. You always got to go back to Genesis. God's word answers us from the very beginning. So let me just take you really quickly. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 5. Here's what it says. You guys know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. There it is. So what we find here from the very beginning is that God, that created the heavens and the earth, took this world. It says that in verse 2, that it was without form. You know the word form in the Hebrew is tohu, which means it was desolate. It was worthless. It was waste. And, and it says not only it was without form, it was void. The Hebrew word for void was bohu which means it was empty. There was undistinguishable ruin. So we have chaos and mass ugliness. But God brought beauty out of that mess. God brought value out of that mess. God brought order. You following me? And after he brought order value, worth, balance, he said, that's good, that's good, all right, you guys following with me, and then all of a sudden, in, when we get to verse 26, I'm going to jump over to 26, then God said, this is on the sixth day, God says, let us make man, verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let me keep reading in verse 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Everything, not just the animal kingdom, they are to subdue it and have dominion over it. Male and female, humankind, to care and steward for what belongs to God that God created when he said, this is good. Every day, first day, second day, third day, all the way to the sixth day, he said at the end of the day, this is good. And what God put into place in man, in the human race, was to, be, to care for what belongs to God. Because nothing ever, when you and I die, you and I do not take U-Hauls to the grave. You guys following me? But while we're alive and all humankind was given a responsibility, all mankind, Adam representing Adam and Eve representing the human race, was given a responsibility to take care of God's creation, to be stewards over everything. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, it all got forfeited. It all got lost. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve decides to take matters into their own hands they disobey God, sin comes in, Satan takes control, takes dominion, takes authority, and he is still in that place today with his agenda, his plan, his scheme since the beginning of time. And so for all those 4,000 years, you have an anti-God spirit, and Satan is wreaking havoc and ruling But Adam and Eve have a third son, and the third son, his name was Seth. Seth and the line of Seth begin to call upon God. It's right there. You see it. It's all there. It's the line of Cain, no one called upon the, uh, the name of God. Wicked race Cain, righteous race Seth. Not perfect, not flawless. Only Jesus was. But these, this lineage of Seth was God-fearing, and they called upon God. And you know where we get Seth? Seth, and, and there's so many genealogies, so many names, but let me just give you some real key names 
from Seth, you know who we got? We get Noah. You know, where we, you know we follow Noah's line? Noah has a son. Shem, he has three sons. But Shem, his line, guess who, are, guess who comes out of Shem's line? Abraham. You know who comes out of Abraham's line? I, Isaac, Jacob. You know who comes out of Jacob's line? All of a sudden you got the 12 tribes. And out of one of those tribes, you got the tribe of Levi. And out of the tribe of Levi, God decides, and he tells Moses, out of that tribe, I'm going to create a priesthood to serve me. And that tribe of Levi was the priest. And the first high priest, one of the sons, was Aaron, brother to Moses. It's interesting that God is the one that told Moses, go set my people free. Oh, God, I can't do this by myself. You guys get into the story, okay? He says, okay, use your brother Aaron. But Aaron and Moses, they're the deliverers. And Aaron the priest. Aaron teaches this to his son, and it goes on for a thousand years more, or whatever that time period is more. I could probably have that date wrong. But we have this going on all the way until we come to Jesus. And there's all this righteous line that leads us to Jesus. Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi, came from the tribe of Judah, but Jesus became the high priest out of the order of Melchizedek. There's a whole lot into this guy. And all those of you that study the Bible, you guys know where I'm going. But here's my point. Jesus comes into the scene, and what Jesus does is he takes back and he reclaims what was lost. Spiritually first, physically later. Because Jesus becomes a second Adam. Where the first Adam, because of his disobedience, sin comes into everybody. But because of the second Adam, sin can be removed or forgiven or, yeah, taken out. The wrath, the, the, the judgment of sin removed because of Christ. You guys following with me? Now that is spiritually done, but physically, Christ will reclaim, Christ will restore that which was lost in the garden. Now, we have a long time to wait for that because we have to wait till he, and, 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 and you know, I don't know if I gave you this scripture, but I, I think this is probably a good time to quote this. Let me see if I found it. I think I wrote it down. Um, well, here's what Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1. Yeah, here it is. Let me just quote a few scriptures, and you could write these down. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. I want, to, I want to read it out of the New Living. Are you guys with me this morning? Here's what it says. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So God, that's already been established because of Christ rising from the dead. And Jesus himself said, you guys remember when he told his disciples after the resurrection, he says, all authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. So Jesus reclaims all authority, takes that back from what Satan has, even though Jesus hasn't in the physical heaven, ha, that hasn't happened, because that won't happen until he comes back. Not the rapture. But the second coming after the tribulation. You guys following me? Uh, okay, now I see the deer and the headlights. <laughs> what? Following me. Jesus raptures his church. Tribulation takes place. Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation. Now physically. It's not that he doesn't have the authority right now. All authority he is in control. God is in control. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is king. But right now, there's still government of men over the whole different governments, different nations over the whole world. And who is over those governments? Satan and his plan and his agenda. 
even the United States, even the United States. There is an antichrist spirit even in the United States. And we have to understand that. Though we are in this world, Jesus told his disciples, listen guys, they pers- there was, okay, going back to the righteous line of Seth and all of those people, men and women, you realize that many of them gave, up their, gave their lives? I mean, there are so many that gave their lives for the faith because they followed God. Jesus himself quotes that, and he says, you know what, all the ancients of old, the prophets, they killed them, and they're going to kill you too. They're going to persecute you too. He's telling this to his disciples. Maybe he should, we should say he's saying that to us. They're going to persecute us too. And in a way, we're seeing a little bit of a form of that, not real major, but it's happening in other countries. Our brothers and sisters are, are dying for the faith. We have it made here in America. But other people in other countries where the gospel is not permitted, they're living for Christ, they're being saved, but they're risking their lives and they're being put to death or imprisoned for the cause of Christ. It's, it, this is real, this is happening. When Jesus comes back, he will reign for a thousand years in the millennia. And then after that, Satan will be released. He's going to be bound in the bottomless pit in the abyss. He will be released to see the nations of the world again because there's an anti-Christ, anti-God spirit. And Satan is behind it all. He's going to deceive them again. But then there's going to be this new world, a new heaven. And we got it. No more devil. You can read all about this in your Bible, guys. But we haven't got there yet. The thing is that we're still here. And and, and we can know that it's true. Because even, let me read in Philippians. Uh, This is, is, you know, Satan doesn't want to believe. Satan Satan is such a liar, he even believes his own lies. (laughs) That's the funny thing about liars, is liars don't even think they're lying. They just believe it, and, and they're outright lying, and they, they just really believe that they're telling the truth, but they're so deceived, and they're lying. That's why I said, whatever media that you watch, listen to, newspaper, news on TV, doesn't who's telling the truth? They're probably all lying. Satan has truly deceived. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Let me begin reading verse... Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him, Jesus, the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. There you go, devil and all your demons of hell and those that have passed on. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has not lost control, even though it seems like the world is out of control. Because Jesus is on the throne, Jesus reigns, and even though that full reignship of that which is to come hasn't happened yet, he's still in control. Does that mean that we do nothing? I already told you, no, we have a responsibility to do something. And that something is on November the 3rd. I am encouraging you, please vote. You're still waiting for me to tell you how to vote, aren't you? So let me tell you. (laughs) I think you... You know, we have an allegiance when we were taught to uh, uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. We have a greater allegiance than the American flag or of our country, a greater allegiance to King Jesus. It's not that we don't abide by the laws of our land. No, by no means. I'll talk about that next week. But we see here, and I'm going to get ready to close this, is what I said earlier, I want to put it on the screen now for you, is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Here's what it says in the NIV. It says, but you are a chosen people. King James says a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. King James says marvelous light. You are that royal priesthood. You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. That's what God's word says. A holy nation, 
a chosen people, a royal priesthood. That's who you are. Just so that we can call ourselves Christians and move around and say I'm a Christian and I go to a Christian church? No. There's much more responsibility that God has given us. Because we are a holy nation, because we are a royal priesthood, because we are a peculiar people, we must make a difference. And how we make that difference is not based upon my opinion or your opinion. Well, I think we ought to. I think we ought to. And I think, man, that's how you get in fights. You know how you, we'd eliminate fighting on Facebook or Twitter or eliminate because everybody's fighting over on these platforms. You know how you, you eliminate that? You just simply say, I'm following the agenda of the, my King Jesus, the kingdom's agenda. I am following an agenda that is not of this world. Even though I'm in this secular government, there is an agenda that I'm going to submit to first and foremost. And because we are Christians and because we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation, God has called you and I to make a difference. Why do you think God said you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. It's to make a difference. A difference in a dark world, a difference in a sour, corrupted society. That's what God has called us to do. So how do we do that? How do we make a difference? By voting. And by voting based upon God's heart. That's how you vote. You vote and you line up whatever the issues are. And you say, God, what is it that you, how do you want me to vote? Because either candidate, both candidates are knuckleheads, amen? You're laughing because you agree with me. Nobody likes... Joe Biden, nobody, uh, many don't like Joe Biden, many don't like Donald Trump. Forget about the personality. Forget about the party. Take that out of your head. Take it out of your head, Republican or Democrat. Think about what God's word is all about. God has entrusted us to be stewards of this world. Now, you can't answer for everybody else. You can only answer for yourself. And how we answer for ourselves, it goes all the way back to Genesis where he says, I've given you a responsibility to take care of what I have created. So that means that anything that is destroyed is not of God. Anything that is killed or murdered is not of God. Anything that goes against human rights is not of God. Anything that goes against the things that God has put into place to value human life is not of God. Do you understand? So as we understand that, it has nothing to do with a party affiliation. So if you are following particular groups on either side that are pro... They all have their names. You guys know their names. I don't have to say their names. There's, there's protest groups on the left and protest groups on the right and they have an agenda and they're causing havoc on both and they're causing... Uh, oh, I agree. Oh, what do I agree? What do, which one do I agree with? You don't agree with any of them. You agree with God's agenda. Not their agenda. What is God's agenda? So even though you may think, well, if I vote this way... I'm going to, to your right, that's your right. I, I, I just, I'm getting confused because it's my left. But if I vote to the right, oh, they're going to think I'm Republican. Stop it. We handed you a piece of paper that shows Democrat. Maybe we should have crossed them out. But so block it out. Get a black marker. Maybe we should have done that before we gave you those copies. Get a black marker and mark it out. Well, what about the colors, Pastor? One's blue and one's red. 
Is that right? One's blue and one's red. <sighs> we should have colored them red and purple. I don't know. I mean, uh, green and blue or something. Or green and whatever. Black and white. <laughs> Black and white. Oh, no. Now, now you're talking uh, social <laughs> culture. Claw. You cannot make anybody happy. We should have just left it gray. <laughs> it's gray. We should have did it gray so that there's no color, no title. And all you do is you look at what these stand for and how does it line up to God's word. How simple is that? How simple is that? So you got to rule out your tradition. Well, we've always voted this. My dad used to do this because he was this. And he told us, I remember him telling my mom when I was growing up. My dad didn't, you know, he only had a sixth grade, seventh grade education. But what he was told was, this is for the working man. And he told my mom, Lucy, that when you go in that booth, this is all you want to do is just boom, 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 boom. And it was, all be, it was for the working class. That's what we were told. It's not the same party anymore, guys. That's changed. So don't be deceived by the liars. And there's liars on both sides. So do you understand? I'm not taking a side, but I am taking the side of the kingdom of God. And I want to end this. Uh, Kimmy, you guys can come on up. Is this. Line it up with God's word. Line it up with God's word. When you go to that polling booth and you vote, and please take a look at the issues, not, just the, not for whoever just is the president, but the, there's issues that are really important that you need to look at and that you need to vote, and you need to pray, God, how do you want me to vote? God will give you the answer. You know what? I can talk for God. You want me to talk for God right now? Lord, is it okay if I talk for you? Here is I'm, I'm going to talk for God. God would say to you, Vote my heart. Vote my heart. The lyrics of that song, let me pull them up again. Here in that bridge, the bridge simply says, Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. That preaches all for itself right there. Break my heart for what breaks yours. If there are things happening that break the heart of God and you and I can make a difference by the things we vote for, by the people we put in office. That's what God is entrusting as a steward. That's, that's our responsibility. So you and I may think, well, how can I take dominion? How can I make a difference and steward on November the 3rd? That's how you do it. You do it by going to that booth or however you're going to vote, and you vote for what breaks the heart of God and to make it right so that we continue that godly line all the way from Adam and Seth until this day, the godly line of being born again and we being called the church to make a difference, to be a light in a dark world. We are in a dark world right now unlike never before. I've said this before and I'll say it one more time. Many of you may not have heard me say this, but about a month or two months ago, I talked to a 100-year-old man. He was born in the year of 1920. 1920 and he turned 100 years old this year and I asked him Bill man was totally in his right mind still standing still functional I said Bill in your 100 years of life have you ever ever experienced what was going on in the world today he said never never and that's why I said we are living in an unprecedented time like never before the history of our country hangs in the balance you and I can make a difference Vote God's heart. Don't stay home. Don't mail it in or however you're going to do it. Vote and make a difference. Either way, we know in the end, we win. We know that. But remember, God has entrusted into us to be a steward over all 
living things. All. That means that we are to be stewards even of the people that are not saved. Even the people that curse God. We are still to be a light to them. We are still to love them. We are still to reach out to them because God cares about their eternal soul. And that's why we make a difference when we vote. Because when we vote for what is right, then it will hopefully give us that time to give those people an opportunity but by, by having the freedoms we have. Mikhail, I'm going to tell you something. It won't be long before the freedoms that we have may be taken away. Let's stand. I'd like us just to sing that bridge one more time before we... We're going to take communion this morning. And as we take communion, and they're preparing for communion right now, is um, we got to realize that, man, this is my way of saying my allegiance is for what he's done for me to my king. When he went to the cross, gave his life, so that not, not, I, not only I can be free but that others can be free as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to just present this message with an unbiased heart, but maybe I could say biased, biased in the way of it being your kingdom. So as we get ready to take communion and honor our king, Lord, we pray that we would be a people who are so what's the word I want to say, humbled, that you have entrusted to us to be stewards and to care about people around us. And one way we can show that is by the vote we make that will help our country be a country that we pray would turn back to you, a country that has gotten so far away, but for us to pray as Christians, God, let your mercy and grace continue. Let your grace abound in a place where there's so much sin so that God gives it, it gives opportunity for many more to come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. So thank you. Father, we love you. We thank you. Prepare our hearts as we take communion. Get ready for communion. Let's sing that bridge. Amen. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things I Break my heart for what I 